It's time for Wise Money with Corhorn Financial Group with certified financial planners Kevin Corhorn, Mike Bernard, and Josh Gregory. Welcome to another episode of the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group, where every week we're helping you take your next wise step in your financial life. Thanks for being here, friends. My name is Mike Bernard. I am your host. I'm also one of the certified financial planners on the show. With me in the KFG studios today, special guest, Brandon Williamson, Dana Trowbridge from First State Bank. Today, we're talking about uh, how every small business needs a relationship with at least one local bank. We're going to tell you why and discuss, you know, why that really mattered so far in 2020 and how it's likely to continue that way. If you have a question, we always hit questions later on in the program. We'd love to hear from you. You can reach out to us a few different ways. Call or text 574-222-2000. That's 574-222-2000. You'll find us online, wisemoneyshow.com. Submit a question right there on the right. And then where most of our questions come from, let's be honest, social media, because that's where you're probably at as soon as you get out of the car. And that's, uh, so Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, wherever, you'll find the Wise Money Show. Just search Wise Money Show and follow us there. Get a lot of questions on the YouTube channel. Every episode's right there as well. So just search the Wise Money Show wherever you're at. Okay, guys, welcome to the show. Good morning. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Thanks, All right. Mike. Well, let's get the pleasantries out of the way, make some brief introductions. Dana was on the program a couple years ago. Brandon is usually texting us during shows. <laughs> I, I can't tell you how many times where a show is going on and Brandon sent us a quick text with a coffee or something like that <laughs> saying, hey, have a good recording. So, but anyway, guys, uh, share an introduction. Well, good morning. Thanks again for having us. We're thankful to be here and thankful for the, the partnership with your show. And I know we've um, had that for a couple of years. And of course, your listeners, all the value that you put out. So thank you for that. Yeah. Um, I've been in banking for just over eight years, and I have the privilege of serving as the business development officer for First State Bank in the St. Joseph County market. First State Bank is a locally owned and operated bank. They're actually celebrating 110 years this year. So for First State Bank, they value community, and I act as an extension of the bank in the community, um, involved in various capacities. A few worth mentioning are on the board for Junior Achievement and represent First State Bank as an ambassador in the South Bend Regional Chamber of Commerce. Nice. Nice, Brandon. Dana. Oh, thanks, Mike. I uh, really appreciate Corhorn Financial Group and all that you guys do for us and everybody else out in the community. Uh, you guys really serve uh, the community well with all of your knowledge and sharing it. Uh, thanks. Uh, I'm Dana Trowbridge. I'm a senior vice president of First State Bank. I'm in charge of the St. Joe County region. I have a great team of lenders, including Brandon, that do a fine fine job with all the small businesses that we serve and, and the community in and of itself. We are definitely a relationship bank, so this topic hits home when it comes to that uh, side of things. Um, I've been in banking a very long time and uh, been at First State Bank over 10 years. I uh, really love the feel of the bank, 125 uh, employees strong as a family, and we uh, are in six different markets, and we really uh, enjoy what we do with who we do it with. Yeah, that's great. That is great. Okay, so here's the interesting thing to me. Many of you know, no matter where you're listening, that the RV market is, a, is an enormous um, part of our local economy. And the interesting thing about the RV market is it tends to be a leading indicator of the economy that, um, that, that when, when the RV market's booming, that typically means the overall economy is going well. It's such a discretionary purchase. But if the RV is struggling, then, then watch out. So um, guys, my sense, I'm curious your sense. My sense is yeah, RV has been going really strong and it actually started getting strong very quickly after the shutdown just tell me, how's how's local business? How's the state of small business these days? Strong, stable, you know, uh, maybe cautious? What do you think? Well, I'd say the it's, it's a good point. Um, the RV industry is a strong indicator. We actually have an incredible credit analyst back at the office that does a fine job over the last handful of years that just um, studies the the trends. And, and again, it's a good indicator. So for small business, um, all over the place. You know, they're all over the place, and each business is experiencing something at different stages at different times. Mm -hmm. So some are struggling more than others, and we're certainly mindful of that, while others are capitalizing and, and having some big wins during this time. So, I mean, for us, the economy changed overnight as we knew it. Um, leaders that dealt with maybe 12 major decisions in a year 
are now facing those 12 decisions by lunchtime. Right. Um, I mean, that's been the, the stage here. So whether having to lay off or furlough an employee or shut down and close the doors to their business, um, it completely changed their operation and way of doing business. Um, now they're managing employees of a completely remote work staff. Yeah. So I, I know Kevin and others have referenced in the past, it's like the five stages of grief, right? How <laughs> quickly do you move towards that stage of acceptance to move um, to move forward? Yeah, so. and you said you go through those five stages by lunch as well, every day. <laughs> <laughs> right, repeat. Dana, what's your yeah. perspective as you talk to businesses, small businesses in the economy? I mean, are things people feeling good or still cautious? Thank you for asking. So uh, the way that I feel about it is uh, I'm in a unique position as a business banker here locally in our market where I pay attention to both the macroeconomic situation nationally and worldwide. I also pay close attention to the state of Indiana. I also pay close attention to our market. And the way I get to do that is I get to talk to my small businesses. So I ask them frequently uh, different segments of the, our local economy and different industries as as to how they're doing and how they're impacted. So since the COVID pandemic has hit, we have added a special section to our loan submission approvals to address that. So mm -hmm. we asked them directly how COVID has affected their business, positive, negatively, or not at all. So we're getting a good feel for how that's been going on. And honestly, it's again, like Brandon mentioned, it's all over the board. But I feel that the economy in the state of Indiana and locally here in our region uh, is a lot less subject to the variances and vagaries of the economy nationally as the coasts are. So we seem to feel that we smooth out the roller coaster here. And as you mentioned, with the RV market being so close and an integral part of our local economy uh, and being strong today, uh, we really haven't felt a huge impact of an economic downturn regionally. Now, of course, there are pockets and industries yeah. and special and businesses that are hurting and that we're doing our best to help mitigate that through uh, additions to their uh, funding like uh, payroll, payroll protection program, yeah. uh, that kind of stuff. But I would say to you that, um, you know, it all comes down to how a business is managed and run individually. So every business is different. And like you guys tend to talk about and emphasize, uh, you know, a strong balance sheet with low debt will always get you through an economic downturn. Whereas if you take on a lot of debt and you have a sudden downturn or there's a, a collapse in your industry or you lose a vendor or a comp competitor moves in as a low barrier to entry, then at that point you could be in trouble. So if you can maintain your businesses with a low debt structure on your balance sheet and a, a strong uh, income, varied income stream, then you're more able to weather downturns no yeah. matter what causes them. Yeah, that's right. It's interesting you bring up what, uh, what a gift it is, you know, here in the Midwest. We don't rely, many of our uh, of, of the employees here don't rely on mass transportation to get to work, right? And yet in, in, uh, in New York with, this, with the virus, who wants to jump on a subway just to get to work or just to get to, some, to a restaurant or something like that? And so uh, our local economy, you're jumping in your car to go do those things or, uh, or whatever. So that's great. So I'm a, I'm a big proponent of online banking. <laughs> Guys, don't get don't get mad at me, but I actually have said on a show before, I'm pretty sure, I don't know if I'll ever step foot in another bank. Uh, <laughs> not because anyone did anything, but you know, would they would, would you could take a picture of a check and have that be depositive uh, deposit. I thought, okay, well, that is the best thing since sliced bread. But right when I thought I'd never have to really go in there, in 2020, the whole deal changed, and it turns out I was completely wrong just about by everything. So we're going to talk about how important the local bank is to your small business. That and more coming up here on the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. Hello, YouTube. Thanks for being here. This is the Wise Money Show. You are at the Wise Money Show channel. If you're not a subscriber, hit that subscribe button, turn on notifications, and smash that thumbs up button. What you're watching right now is our one-hour talk show that airs every single Saturday right here. Also on podcast, if you're into that, and then airs on a couple local radio stations in northern Indiana. Uh, throughout the week, we have more digestible 
financial uh, suggestions for you. We call them next wise step videos. Come out every single business day. Take something that's going on in the headlines, whether it's, hey, is McDonald's stock in a bubble? What about the Tesla bubble? What happened to GDP? Should you panic? All that sort of stuff. So you'll get those every single business day. So if you're not a subscriber, hit that subscribe button, turn on notifications, and smash that thumbs up button. Share the content as well. Thank you very much. All right. Good. Yeah, it's, uh, there's a, always a little juggle. <clears throat> okay, do I go on to the next question and then quickly oh, cut sure, you off? Sure. Or do I just take it? But it is interesting, you know, and people could be listening really from anywhere. But I wonder, I think, Danny, you're completely right. Uh, uh, large metropolitan areas likely are, are, at, were much more impacted by this. Um, you know, they may have been leveraging <clears throat> technology possibly a little bit stronger than the average business here. But uh, maybe remote work was more of a common thing in big metropolitan areas. But I would imagine South Bend did a better job at man or had had fewer um, had fewer reductions and so on than a place like New York City or Chicago. It also seems to me um, we're not on the air, right? But it seems Ed, we're on break. Okay, so. yeah. So it seems to me though that that our macro economy here locally is more diversified than the big urban areas. Yeah. So we have manufacturing, we have agriculture, we have those things that spread the risk yeah. for a recessionary type atmosphere. Yeah. So that tends to smooth out the roller coaster a little bit because not everybody's, every industry's hit hard all at once, yeah. mostly. Now, obviously, sometimes like the Great Depression and the Great yeah. Depression, everybody felt it one way or another. But I still think the depths of those are not as low in the middle of the country than it is on the coast i totally agree and that's just how i feel about it totally agree anecdotal evidence lots of stats i could be throwing out <laughs> <laughs> all right so we'll hit that first question i mean this could mean we're going a full show here and that's okay i mean unless you guys got to rush out of here no no no, do no, no need, okay. i thought okay. we do still have to sort of talk about relationship banking we will or even we get into oh he's just saying it's flowing well yeah 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 yeah, yeah 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 so we're we'll we'll stay on schedule which means we'll go to that next question which is about you know relationship local bank Good. that oh, okay. and then we'll uh gotcha and then we'll transition into CARES Act, sure. PPP, Perfect. all that sort of stuff. Perfect. So, Good. and we'll just see how long it takes. I mean, mm -hmm. again, I don't think it's rare that we stay exactly on schedule. So <laughs> it's all good. So, all right. Every every small business, your small business right now needs to have a relationship with local bank, not just an electronic relationship with your computer, with an app. You've got to have a relationship with a local bank. I'll tell you why coming up right now. This is the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. My name is Mike Bernard. Here with me in the KFG studios, my friends from First State Bank, Brandon Williamson, Dana Trowbridge. If you've missed anything so far, every episode of the Wise Money Show is right there on podcast, wherever you listen, whether that's Spotify, whether that's iTunes, apparently no one listens to iTunes podcasts. I do. <laughs> I do. And so if you do as well, check us out there. Just search the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group, wherever you're at in podcasts, subscribe. It'll rate us there as well. Helps others who are looking for wise financial content um, find the show. So we appreciate that. All right, guys. So I, I've shared that, listen, you know, with, with all the technology, I'm not, I, you know, my banking relationship is more with a smooth functioning app than it is with you guys, although we've got a great relationship. And then 2020 happened, and just like uh, so many things, it changed all the rules. And, and you, every small business, needs, I mean, when it was crunch time for small businesses, you needed a relationship, not with an app, you needed a relationship with your local bank. Let's talk about some of those reasons. Well, you talked about not stepping foot into a bank, and you're like many consumers where they they appreciate technology. Um, that's certainly fine, but I think the key is relationship. So you're still having that communication with your bank. At First Aid Bank, our values are customer-focused and relationship-centric um, while being locally owned and operated. So relationships build trust and familiarity with your client, but it's a, it's a two-way street. It goes both ways, both with the client and the client with the bank and the banker. So an example of that is some clients might value, let's say, their interest rate for their loans. 
that rate, especially when it comes to business lending, tends to get better over time with that relationship and as it develops and unfolds. So a well-rounded relationship can be having a mortgage or Mm -hmm. a checking account or what we call at the bank a full wallet share for that relationship. Yeah. Randy, you said that very well. Great job. Um, So relationship also deepens the trust and it deepens the understanding of the business. And the more that bankers can understand a business and how it's run and what it, why it does what it does, the better they can help the business. So it comes down to being a relationship that includes your banker as a trusted advisor. So as a business, you should have a group of trusted advisors. Corhorn Financial Group can help you with both taxing or taxation and also with uh, financial uh, investment uh, management. So Mm -hmm. those things are something that you would rely on Corhorn Financial Group to do as a trusted advisor. And your banker is your trusted advisor when it comes to borrowing money, uh, deposits, these uh, cash management, treasury management, these kinds of things are what banks can do as a trusted advisor. And of course, you have an insurance agent that's a trusted advisor, and you may have other consultants and others that are trusted advisors too. So that trusted advisor status is what a relationship brings to your business. And you need to be able to discuss important financial situations and others with people that, that have had experience and that work with others and that can use that experience to help you and your business grow and prosper, which is what my goal is to do. Well, and and we can say those sorts of things on the other side of this, but you know, when March when March happened, and it was, I remember I was on a phone calls late at night with Josh and with Kevin and Jared Moxinus here, and we we're saying, what in the world is going on, and what should we do? Are we going to need to send all of our employees home and have them? And and I remember it was. It was at that moment when I looked and, oh, NBA season canceled. It, when when your business all of a sudden faces a shutdown and you're looking at where am I going to get credit or resources, you better be able to contact a person, not pull up an app. You can pull up that app at any time. It's very convenient. You better be able to contact a person at the bank and say, I actually don't. I, we had this plan for this quarter or this year, and that plan is completely up in the air. Is my credit line available? Am I am, am I in good standing? What should I be doing? And you want to have Dana and Brandon and the folks at your local bank in your back pocket. So, I mean, the rules change. Everything changed Absolutely. overnight in, in, in 2020. So speaking of those rules being changed, a lot of that was the CARES Act. Um, and, and that was the first, well, let's say the, con- the Congress's first stimulus bill. Now, we're pre-recording this. I'm just going to, you know, full and fair disclosure, the HEALS Act was released just recently. Um, by the time this is airing or by the time you're watching this, it may, may be dead in the water, maybe moving forward. But let's talk a little bit about the CARES Act and some of the support that was in there to try to help small businesses in particular. I know First State Bank was on the front lines helping many customers with the PPP loan. So let's talk a little bit, a little bit about that and 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 First State Bank. Well, you have no better person here to talk about it than Dana Trowbridge, and he'll speak to that in here in just a moment. But as a community bank, we were certainly thankful to facilitate various applications to support our community. It seemed that this was a time that our clients um, needed us most, so we were th- certainly thankful to step up and be on the front lines as an essential business to help process those applications and various business requests. Just like you said, you were picking up the phone and saying, what do we do? We wanted to be there for our businesses and and help them as they were dealing with this uncertainty. Um, So at First Aid Bank, we processed more than 400 applications for the PPP loans, funding over 60 million. And that's all great, but what's more humbling is knowing that those funds went directly to preserving over 7,000 employees in both Elkhart and St. Joe County. Wow, that's fantastic, guys. Thanks. Yeah, we did a great job and we're very happy and proud about doing it, and mostly for our clients who are giving us the um, feedback that says that they were very appreciative of what we did for them so far. Now, of course, uh, those that got the PPP funds uh, are uh, waiting and anticipating for what to happen as far as the forgiveness side of it goes. So that's the next big wave of uh, information sharing that we'll be having with our customers and the government when it comes to getting those loans forgiven in the best way possible. So we're, we're ramping up for that now. We're waiting for some additional information from the SBA and the Treasury 
and hopefully Congress makes some uh, changes to make that a smoother situation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, right now, the PPP uh, funds are still available up to 100000 and they're still available to apply for till the first week of August. At this point, we anticipate that possibly could be extended. But the PP program was a very good program uh, put out by the government on a very quick basis. There were two waves. That first wave we uh, participated in very heavily, and we go back again to that relationship situation where uh, we took care of our customers very quickly and uh, expeditiously in order to get them the funds and get them in their hands as fast as possible so they could retain their employees like Brandon mentioned. That was essential and key. Uh, if you didn't have a, a relationship with our bank, we had many calls from people that were struggling with the banks that they were working with, and they asked us to step in and help them. In a few cases, we did that, but in most cases, all I did was try to help guide them through the process with their other bank and what they needed to do to try to get the funds in place. Um, uh, it was a situation where we had the capacity to handle all the customers that we currently had. Most banks uh, felt the same situation that we provided the PPP approval and funding uh, in order to help them uh, weather the storm at the time. And we didn't anticipate uh, this as a money-making proposition. We anticipated it just to be a uh, break-even proposition in order to be able to help our customers maintain their businesses so they could come out the back end uh, in the best way possible and uh, continue to make the payments on their other loans that they um, have with us at the time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what an what an integral part. I, when when the CARES Act first came out, I was hearing all the details, and I thought, oh, my goodness, what have we done? <laughs> this thing is so complicated, and it's $3 trillion. What in the world? <laughs> and, and, and But the PPP loan stood out as such an important and meaningful part of the CARES Act for small businesses and to retain those jobs. So thanks to you both for that. We've got more about small business programs to help your business during this unprecedented time. That and more coming up on the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. All right, that got a, that got a touch long. So, okay, so, so Brandon, 7,000 jobs. 7,000 employees, yeah. So that's that, incredible. That to us yeah, is it's more long. powerful than the, you know, impactful than the, the money. Cause that's what it's for. That's right. Is to preserve that, you know, the employees. So yeah, I remember. So back in 2000, so this, this is, you know, there, uh, every recession uh, ha has similarities and, and they all have differences. Right. And so this one, um, you know, being very sharp, but, I don't know. We'll see. Very, maybe quick. I, I don't know. 2007, 2008 felt like it was, uh, you know, Groundhog's Day, but uh, like a nightmare. <laughs> you know, like every day was like, oh, this is so painful. Where not like this time, it was every day felt like a week. There was so much change mm -hmm. and everything right. was going on. Um, but I remember being so grateful to retain employees during that time. D during 2008, 2009, 2010, I remember just feeling this sense of appreciation for the folks that we, we've retained on our team during that time. And the PPP loan was designed to help businesses keep their valued team members on through this time. And you guys were an integral part of that as, as, uh, as members of First State Bank. That's, that's wonderful. Very um, satisfying. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so... Um, anything additional to say about PPP? I'm uh, not sure about PPP, but we can certainly touch on some of the other things that, you know, the e IDL. Yeah, yeah. And, yep. Uh, you know, so, know, so, all right. So Main let's transition. Yep. Let's transition to the next two and based on the next two questions and based on how we're going, we'll probably, we'll probably go into this third segment. So we'll probably, um, be going into the fourth so that's good okay. so so we'll hit uh what other programs in the cares act what other solutions mm -hmm. uh first state bank offers small businesses and then we'll mm -hmm. get into mm -hmm. uh we'll keep going from there so you start to get again okay all right ready mm -hmm. the ppp program yeah it had its drama it is extremely beneficial and it paycheck protection program helped businesses keep employees 
And the folks at First State Bank were a big part of that, uh, helping to retain 7,000 employees during that time through helping small businesses. That's wonderful. This is this is a Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. Thanks for being here. My name is Mike Bernard. Here with me in the KFG studios, my friends, Dana Trowbridge, Brandon Williamson from First State Bank. We're talking about banking and small business banking for your small business. And we're talking about a few different programs, just talked about the PPP. If you have any questions, you can submit questions wherever you find the Wise Money Show. You can find us online, wisemoneyshow.com, submit questions right there on the right. Then all over social media, whether that's a YouTube channel, whether that's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever, reach out to us there. Search the Wise Money Show and follow us. Okay, guys, so we talked about the Paycheck Protection Program. We're recording this a little early as of right now. The HEALS Act, as of the time we're recording this, could add a little bit more to the PPP, some changes to it. You mentioned, Dana, that the the current deadline for the first PPP could even be extended beyond the, what is it, August 8 deadline. Um, so, so we'll see. What other small business programs were part of the CARES Act that, uh, that, that folks should know about? So uh, they had the EIDL, which is the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, which was a direct program with the SBA that was applied for online by businesses in conjunction with the PPP. Uh, Of course, being a government program, there are several stipulations about it. There was a $10,000 or $1,000 per employee advance on that loan. Then the money would be given to you on... um, a loan basis of above and beyond that, and that money could be used for other expenses for the business that the PPP loan was not covering. Uh, Additionally, the SBA put out a program where all 7A and 504 loans uh, would be paid by the government for the next six months, principal and interest payments. Uh, So anything that was up to and including September 27th approved uh, by the SBA would get a six month, not just a deferral, but a complete grant of six months worth of payments. That is essential for a lot of those businesses that needed the 7A or the 504 program to get a loan done in the first place. So that's very helpful for them and that's ongoing right now. Uh, The CARES Act also had a another provision in it called the Main Street Loan Lending Program, which is a larger company loan program above and beyond the 500 employee uh, maximum that the SBA allows for the PPP. So that was a, a very long machination with the government working out the details on that. Uh, I believe that they've started that program. I have not been involved in it, but I believe they've started it. I've heard some things about it. Um, but uh, those are some of the things that the CARES Act included and, and the government itself did to help business uh, in the pandemic situation. Yeah. Let, well, let's talk about then, obviously, you guys have been helping small businesses, a lot of PPP, a lot of, a lot of other things. But, I mean, what are the, the other solutions and services that First State Bank has been offering to businesses during this unprecedented time? Well, we certainly understand that the pandemic might be the same, but how businesses react and consumers react and respond to this, no situation is the same. They're each different. So we have to deal and approach each situation with that care and understanding, and that's something we're certainly mindful of. So ultimately, we're thankful to be with a community bank that places our clients first, and through that communication and, again, that relationship, we'll do whatever possible for our clients. A couple of things we've done is we've done deferments for those that um, say they were um, landlords and they had rental properties and the the tenants uh, needed uh, payment deferral for their leases. So we deferred those commercial mortgages Mm -hmm. uh, in the, you know, hand in hand with those people as they requested it. Mm -hmm. Uh, We didn't do blanket deferrals, but we did deferrals as the situation warranted, just like Brandon mentioned a second ago. Uh, So we did some of those. Uh, We've also done some refinancing and restructuring and those kinds of things that as needed. So we look at each individual situation. We do some analysis. We work with the clients and the good communication back and forth makes it such that we can do uh, those things that are needed as reasonable to Mm -hmm. help them in situations like this. And, And we'll do all that and then some. Yeah. And we're, you know, it's interesting. We talk about this and and the economy, air quotes here, is Mm -hmm. reopened. But I would say cautiously. And we've got a lot of local governments that are imposing shutdowns and so on. And so 
Uh, guys, we're just not through this. And so if, if you work at a small business, you run a small business, more importantly, if you own a small business and you don't have a relationship with a local bank, you've got to do that. During the PPP loan especially, it was uh, there was this mad rush to the door. Think of... Um, Think of Black Friday at Walmart, like when they open their doors, like that's what was going on with banks and you needed that relationship. So if you don't have one, reach out and make sure you've got one set up. Um, Dana, earlier you talked about uh, overall financial health and health of a small business. Now, at a, at a high level, at a macro level, talking about publicly traded companies, um, there is this huge incentive to get debt right now, making their balance sheets risky, and that actually greatly concerns me. Um, but it, for a small business, they're not trying to manipulate and do those sorts of things. But I, just, I guess I'm curious, are there certain things that small businesses should be certain they're doing right now to make sure they're in strong financial standing or maybe avoid doing certain things? Or what would you tell a small business as far as specific steps to be taken to make sure they're in great financial health? Well, the most important step is with any situation at any time with the banking relationship that you should have is communication. You need to be communicating with your banker the good, the bad, and the ugly, and there's a little bit of all of it all the time. So you need to be up front. Uh, when someone blindsides the bank and doesn't uh, let on that there's an issue and then all of a sudden does something like files bankruptcy or whatever, mm. it never goes well. Mm. But we could avoid things like that if you have communication with your bank and you let them know where they're at and what's going on and what they foresee and show us some projections and, and, what, and address the problem with us directly as a trusted advisor. It always helps to do that than it does to just throw the keys at the bank as you're driving by the door and, and, and hide <laughs> under a rock. Well, I mean, I mean, so. no one would want to go through that. So, so I mean, hopefully that's even the that's at the very end of a whole bunch of other discussions and and decision points as well. So, right. Yeah. And another thing I mentioned earlier, and you just mentioned it a minute ago, and, and I think it's a very important point that I want to emphasize, and that is, you know, everybody talks about historically low rates, historically low rates. The rates are so low, money so cheap, blah blah blah. That doesn't mean that you have to take that money. It doesn't mean that you have to uh, load up your balance sheet with cheap debt. Yeah. It's not going to stay cheap forever. And as far as that goes, um, you know, no debt is, is, is the way to go. So the lower the debt you can do, and that's something that uh, I would suggest that if you're sitting on a pile of cash and you've got some debt, you need to pay that debt down so you can continue to weather things like this for the long run. In all cases. So you should do that whether or not there is a pandemic. Uh, so that's the kind of um, advice that I give all my clients is uh, try to get your debt low. Some of my best clients have no debt, but mm. what they have is available cash committed, uh, funds committed from the bank that they can use when they need them in a situation like this, whereas the, uh, uh, they can use their cash and then they can turn around and borrow from us when they need it because they have it in place because they were strong enough to be able to get it when they need when they could. Yeah, that's, yeah, that, that's right. And I, I guess I would just... Um, reiterate what Dana said, who, um, by the way, if you're just joining us, is a banker and just said, <laughs> and, and just said, I would be, I would be working on paying off debt. No debt is the way to go. Yes, and, and so, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I completely, I completely agree because one of the things, and this is, this is geeky, we're bumping up against a, a hard stop here, but, um, you know, the, the, the measure of free cash flow. And, you know, whereas um, debt can be leverage, it sucks free cash flow because you've got a debt obligation. And so, um, yeah, so you, you got to be you got to be careful. You got to have a healthy financial uh, uh, financial situation. We've talked before about making sure your financial situation is decisionable. We're going to apply that to this time period and your small business coming up on the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. Good stuff. Good stuff. So when you guys are, um, this is break, is bonus content for YouTube, but um, yeah, so this is this is just just YouTube, but mm -hmm. I've talked before about, you know, credit is sort of, uh, sort of like an accordion, right? You can, ex I mean, the overall credit can be expanded or contracted. And, um, and an example of this would be, you know, 2005, six, seven, credit was expanding. Sure, you don't need to have a down payment. And I'm ta not talking about good. First State Bank or whatever, yeah, I'm talking right. about nationally, possibly even globally. And are we seeing that accordion starting to contract right now? 
I, and I'll, tell, I'll give you an example. I had a, a, a client who's got twins in college. And he said, hey, want to start building some credit. What would you suggest? And I said, well, two suggestions. You either find a, a, a college-specific or, or starter credit card with a big national, or you go to your local bank where there's a relationship. And, and he likes to do things online. And so he found a college credit card. It said college credit card. And child was denied mm-hmm. because she didn't have a job in co- for a college credit card. And, and so it just that seems to suggest credit is shrinking. What, what's your sense? I've heard rumors and innuendos that um, credit card companies and banks are uh, lowering lines, unused lines of credit. Yep. Mm-hmm. And that's more a function of them than you, if that happens to you. Uh, it's their balance sheets and their committed funds that they need to monitor more. And so if you have a $20,000 credit card that you never use, they're going to do something about that. Probably, yeah. So you either use it, which I don't recommend, or you allow them to lower it, and then at some point you ask for it to be increased again. But they may not do that if you don't use it. So uh, obviously to get a good credit score, you know, build that credit score above 800, you need to use some credit, but you need to use it wisely, and you need to use it appropriately, and you need to use it uh, as little as it takes to get your score to where it needs to yeah. be from a credit, personal credit score perspective. And the same with businesses. Uh, you know, we have committed lines of credit out there that businesses have that they don't use much. But I suggest to them to use it a little bit and pay it back, and it's a small amount of interest. Mm-hmm. And then we're more likely to leave it where it's at and yeah. extend it or increase it if you need it. Yeah, because you used it. I, actually, the, since we're going into the fourth segment, and this is a longer segment, I, I might actually bring that up because I've got sure. a couple more thoughts on that. And that sure. I, I think even our local listeners here will find that would find that really helpful. Sure. So, all right. Well, let's get into it. Let's let's um, talk about uh, the, those those last two questions. There, I'll probably add this one, and then if there's mm-hmm. time, there's a, there is a listener question. You guys don't have it, but about. Um, from an individual side, should I do a variable rate or a fixed rate mortgage? So if there's time, we might hit that. I'd be interested in your perspective and certainly have a lot of thoughts myself. So we're going up to 13 and then we're closing the show. So thanks for listening to the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. My name is Mike Bernard. I'm your host. I'm also one of the CFPs on the show. Special show today. I've got my friends Dana Trowbridge and Brandon Williamson joining me from First State Bank. We're talking about we're talking about the importance of a local business relationship for your small business. And for those of you who say, "Well, I might work in a small business," or actually, I, I don't. Um, is this important? Yes, yes. You should still have a relationship with your local bank, your local institution. So make sure you rush out and do that. If you've missed anything on this program. Every episode of the Wise Money Show is on the YouTube channel, so check it out. Go to YouTube, search the Wise Money Show. You'll catch this episode, all other episodes, as well as Next Wise Steps, the daily financial nuggets that we post every single business day, taking what's going on in the world of finance, applying it in a more eh, a shorter, briefer uh, uh, content uh, every single business day. So reach out and follow us there. All right, guys, so one of the principles that we talk about on the Wise Money Show all the time is making sure your financial life is decisionable. Now, when I apply this principle to small businesses, I think a few things, you know. Are your, you know, we, we have a, a, an accounting firm, CPA firm. So do you actually keep up on your financial statements? You know, are, are they current? Um, and where do you stand with having a local local bank? So what else would you guys say, especially during a time of crisis, uh, what else would you guys say that a small business needs to do either to their financial statements or just to their business or whatever to make sure that they are dis- they're, they're in a decisionable spot? Well, as you said, we, we certainly appreciate the fact that you keep those financials updated because we, <laughs> we love to see those. Yeah. Um, but as you said, there's also different metrics that go into banks' decisions, and each bank may place a higher priority to one over another. So I think the common denominator today and, and what we've seen is maintaining that relationship and the key is communication. So simply asking your banker, what, what do I need to pay attention to? What do I need to take action on? Um, it might be one answer today. It could be a different Different answer next week, so that's why it's key to maintain that relationship. Anything you'd add, Dana? 
That's a great point, Brandon. Um, you know, every business and every industry has different touch points when it comes to what they're looking at from a financial stability and financial metric perspective. So banks look at different things for different businesses and different industries. You should know what those are as a business owner or a CFO type position. Uh, all you have to do is ask, and if your bank won't tell you, you need to find a different bank. Uh, so that's something where you guys are both on the same page and you can understand where everybody's coming from when you're talking about those kinds of things. Uh, when I go back to making a decisionable or your actionable uh, business, one of the things uh, would make it decisionable would be, again, uh, keeping your balance sheet in, in good shape because when you have a, a high net worth, a low debt structure, and a, 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 a good solid asset base, what happens then is it allows you more options. Flexibility is key when it comes to business. You need to be able to yeah. make, the, make good decisions and pivot when you need to pivot. And when you have a high debt and a negative net worth and, and uh, you're not in control of your uh, profit and loss statement through expense um, mitigation or, or revenue streams, then you don't have as many options and you can get boxed in and then that's what then hurts your business. So if you maintain strong financial situation with your business or work towards that on every level, then your options increase every step of the way. And that's really important. So you can make good decisions and you have lots of them to make. Yeah, yeah, that's that's absolutely right. And, and you know, from my perspective, I would tell you, make sure your financials are staying updated and make sure they're accurate. I meet with a lot of business owners and we, we I ask for their balance sheet, ask for their P&L. And when it comes to the balance sheet, they always, there's t- not always, typically there's something where they say, yeah, I don't even know what this is. You know, how do we clean this up? Yeah, make sure it's clean. You got to Kevin uh, Kevin Corhorn often says, "Fix the roof while the sun's shining." You you want to clean that stuff up before you're in crisis mode. And then the other thing is, I know you run your small business. That is um, that that's where you need to invest your energy. And so a lot of business owners delay and extend their taxes. Well, listen, you got to have your taxes done. All right. You've got to have, you got to be in good standing. So it's not, it's not something where it's like, well, you know, I'll get around to that. When crisis hits, you've got to have your taxes done it, so that you can give those to the bank and, and, um, and that they can see where you're at. So, um, and then finally, I would mention for you business owners, your personal financial statement. Oftentimes, you in the business, yes, there's limited liability and there's that corporate veil, if you will. But listen, you're the financial, you're part of the financial backing of your small business. Your personal financial life needs to be documented and accurate and in a position where you can quickly create a, a, a personal financial statement and sign it. I don't know about you guys, but uh, when I see those pages and pages pl- pages of blank lines saying, hey, business owner, please create your personal financial statement. I don't see a lot of business owners who are excited to fill those out. (laughs) So our opinion is just have a net worth statement. We create those for all of our clients and you can just press one button, print, sign it. Here's my personal financial statement. Speaking of, you know, all of this sort of blends together and, and I'm just curious, how do you guys see lending different post COVID-19? Like, is there a permanent, I wonder about whether this is creating a permanent change in education. I wonder if it's going to create a permanent change in many businesses. You guys see changes in how lending or, or banking works post COVID? I'd say absolutely. Um, uh, first of all, you mentioned a little while ago how you didn't want to step in a bank and that uh, you do everything <laughs> online and you take a picture of your check, which is what I do also, by the way. <laughs> so even as a banker and I'm working at a bank, I still take pictures of them. <laughs> yep, to yeah. my account. I would say that technology has been ramping up uh, quite extensively. Uh, just recently, our banks rolled out. We had it on the, the consumer side for opening accounts in that previously, which was e-sign, but now we do electronic signing on the business side too. So just yesterday, I have a client who happened to be in Italy and I emailed him some documents and he e-signed them from Italy. Wow. Uh, so as far as that goes, um, those are some changes that we're going to see from a from going forward from a technology side. So that really makes a huge difference in, in the way we can get things done at the speed which we can get them done and the ease which we can get them done. So I think uh, technology will continue to, to ramp up. As you know, FinTech is getting bigger and bigger yeah. and bigger. In fact, um, back to the PPP, there were 
four or five fin- uh, nation- nationwide online fintechs that did massive amounts of PPP lending. Cabbage, Cabbage was one was of them. Huge. Yeah. With Lendio, a K. <laughs> yeah, Lendio was one. There, yeah. were, there were others. And uh, they did huge amounts of PPP, and that was all online on, yeah. uh, tech. So yeah. uh, I see that continuing. I see that, um, uh, you know, brick and mortar will probably continue to always be there. I don't yep. see that going away. Some people had the brick and mortar branches dead a long time ago. I don't ever see that happening. I think there'll always be a core group of consumers that will want to stay at the I want to go to the bank uh, and, and, and see a human. Yep. So, I mean, I get that. But uh, from a lending perspective, I think that um, uh, lines of credit and – uh, those kinds of working capital structures, uh, f- facilities are going to be looked at a little tighter in a, in a recession than they mm. are in a non-recessionary uh, period. Yep. Like you mentioned about mortgage, they were giving away mortgages hard in 05 and yep. then in 08 they weren't. Right. So I think in downturns, things are looked at a little tighter. Uh, you know, maybe if you ask for an increase, you'll have to have a better reason than just because I want it. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> so, a good point. Right. So I think that uh, until things uh, continue to improve, which I fully believe they're going to get a lot better very quickly, uh, those are the kinds of things that I see going on currently and in the future. Brandon, you know how to play an accordion? Not myself, no. No, so listen, you know, no, no, no shame on any of you accordion players out there. We have uh, one of... One of my great friends here at Corhorn Financial Group, I've worked with them for nearly 20 years, used to play the accordion. And uh, so I, it might not be a very popular instrument these days, but I, I make an analogy that credit is sort of on a, on a macro level is like an accordion. It, you're, the available credit can expand and contract. Well, who's, who's got the hand? Who's got the powerful hand? It's just the overall economy. And it's bank's comfort level, lender's comfort level, with uh, with what's going on in the economy, we had a very expanded accordion back in two thousand five, six, seven. You can buy that house, sure. You don't have an income, that's fine. Here's a million bucks to go buy a million dollar house. Um, that, by the way, was only worth three hundred thousand. Um, so a lot of expansion of credit, and and I'm wondering, is there a contraction of credit happening right now? And I'm not picking on you know First State Bank or even a local local bank. I'm talking about macro level. Are we seeing a contraction of credit, do you guys think? I've seen some uh, evidence that banks are, uh, once again, as they did back in that period, uh, contracting their uh, credit card limits. So if you have a $20,000 credit card limit and you haven't used it in a while, you may get a friendly little letter in the mail that says, you know, hey, uh, Mike, uh, we're going to cut back on your credit limit because we need to or you haven't used it or whatever excuse they want to (laughs) use. I would say that that's not necessarily a reflection of you and, and, and your personal situation. It's more a reflection of them and their financial situation although they will they, they'll they'll come up with some excuse that makes it seem like you've done something <laughs> i was sharing during a break that uh i had a i had a client who uh, you know it's really important that you build credit so and danny you probably will speak mm-hmm. to this you got to be building healthy habits of credit well i had a student in college and apply for a college credit card denied denied that doesn't make any sense to me so um so anyway so uh, there is some evidence that credit cards in particular, mm-hmm. right? Yep. So, okay, so from a business standpoint, with this contracting potential, what about lines of credit? So is this a reason to maybe use a little bit, even though you don't necessarily need it? Or what are your thoughts there? Well, sure. Um, you know, banks, and as we talked about a minute ago, I'm a very um, debt-averse kind of guy, and they ramsayite when it comes to that kind of thing, even on the business side. And I have great clients that uh, mind, are mindful of that. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I think that, uh, you know, you certainly want to use your credit appropriately, but you want to use it when you when and if you can for those quick purchases, for those uh, don't know how I want to finance it in the long run, but I want to get it done now type yep. situation. Take advantage of a, of a favorable financial situation where you can get something at a discount or that yep. kind of thing. So certainly using your line of credit is a, is a good thing for everybody. It's a small amount of interest nowadays based on the low interest rates that banks are charging for those kind of work, working capital yep. things. And most certainly, uh, it, it's favorable to the renewal and possible increase if it's warranted for that kind of thing. 
yeah. uh, when, it, when the time comes. Well, that's, that's sound advice. Guys, thanks for being on the program. Mike, it's been a Thank pleasure. You. Yeah, Dana, Brandon, you guys have provided great wisdom to the community and your small business that's been that's been listening. So, uh, you know, I, I will. Uh, they've been um, a sponsor of the show, the Wise Money Show, and what we're trying to do here since the very beginning. So we're th- so thankful for First Date Bank. And then, you know, personally, we get we have a strong relationship. You guys have been wonderful. So, if for your small business, you don't have a local uh, relationship, work. You know, reach out to First Date Bank. These guys are great. So. On behalf of Brandon, Dana, all of us at KFG, that's all the time we have. Have a great weekend. We'll see you next Saturday for Wise Money with Corhorn Financial Group. Securities offered through Silver Oak Securities, member FINRA slash SIPC. Advisory services offered through KFG Wealth Management, LLC. Doing business as Corhorn Financial Group. KFG Wealth Management, LLC and Silver Oak Securities Incorporated companies are unaffiliated.